Okay, so let's start today's class. It's a very important one under neonatology, that is low birth weight. It's a relatively a bit uh, big topic. So let me explain this slowly, okay? I will take a bit of time to explain through this. Now, low birth weight uh, is defined as at the time of birth, if any baby is having birth weight less than 2500 gram, that is irrespective of the gestation. We don't care if that baby is born before 37 week, if the baby is born at 32 week or 40 or 42 week, whatever, if the weight is less than 2500 gram or 2.5 kg, then it is called low birth weight or LBW. Now, the low birth weight is roughly divided into two types, preterm low birth weight and term low birth weight. Now, preterm low birth weight okay, means those babies are born prematurely before 37 week. But term low birth weight means they are born after 37 completed weeks, but still less than 2500 gram. And usually these babies suffer from IUGR, intrauterine growth retardation or restriction, whatever you want to say. Now there is another term known as a small for gestational age, SGA. Now actually speaking, this, these two are not the same thing, okay? IUGR is a general term. Okay. IUGR is a very general term. It is a process actually. If, uh, if the birth weight of a baby is less than 10th percentile for that particular gestational age, then we call that small for gestational age. In the next slide, I will uh, describe this in detail. Now, see here, SGA, baby is born with birth weight, two standard deviation below the mean, or if you don't want to remember that way, you can simply say below 10th percentile for that gestational age is called SGA. These babies look smaller. Now, how common is low birth weight? Almost 25 to 35% of the baby who are born in the developing world are low birth weight. That's a huge percentage. If we compare this with the developed country, Okay, they may be having two to three or two to five percent only. Now, out of that, 10 to 12 percent are preterm, and almost two third or more than that are small for gestational age or IUGR baby. So, IUGR babies comprises of large majority of low birth weight babies. Now, one one small point I like to highlight here. Okay. You are from different parts of the world here. Majority of the students are from Pakistan. So when you go to any exam, okay, any exam, you must know what is the percentage of low birth weight in your country. Similarly, my students from Africa or some Middle East country, they should also know the respective data of their country. Remember that. Out of that, what percentage is preterm? What percentage is SGA? In any exam, this type of questions can be asked. Now, this slide is very important because it is providing us a good concept here. Now, let me explain this properly. On this side, there is a weight of the baby at the time of birth, okay, weight. This is y-axis and here is x-axis. In x-axis, it is gestational age or weeks of gestation. Now, see here, you can see two lines here, okay. The upper line is 90th percentile, okay, 90th percentile, and the lower line is 10th percentile. Now, what we do, let's take one example here, 38 weeks of gestation. So I take a weight of the baby who is born at 38 weeks of the gestation, and I will plot that weight in this graph. Now, where that weight belongs in the graph or lies in the graph, does it fall in between this line? Does it fall below than this lower line or does it fall above than the upper line? Okay, accordingly, I will classify into three types. A small for gestational age, if it falls below this lower line, that is 10th percentile. If it falls 
in between these two lines, we call it appropriate for gestational age, AGA. And very few babies, they may fall uh, even higher than the upper line. They are large for gestation age. Yesterday, I took a class about infant of diabetic mother. This particular infant fall in this group, large for gestation age. <clears throat> okay, And many IUGR babies fall under small for gestation age. A normal full term baby fall under appropriate for gestation age. This is a very, very important knowledge. So from next time, when we talk about SGA, AGA and LGA, you know exactly what we are talking about, whether they fall less than 10 percentile for that particular gestational age, whether they fall between 10th and 90th percentile or they fall above the 90th percentile. Now, let's move on. Now, what are the types of uh, low birth weight? This is a rough classification. It is LBW or low birth weight uh, if, if it falls between 2500 gram and 1500 gram. Means up to 1500 from 2500, we call it low birth weight. Now, less than 1500 up to 1000 is called very low birth weight. Okay, very low birth weight, VLW. And less than 1000 gram is called extremely low birth weight. Extremely low birth weight. Now, one point I like to highlight here in some of the, uh, especially the British te textbook, okay, British textbook, they can mention another, uh, you know, type of uh, birth weight also. And that is called incredibly low birth weight incredibly low birth weight that is less than okay that is less than 750 gram but the, till now the american textbook in pediatrics they simply mention extremely low birth weight they, they don't mention incredibly low birth weight. probably you know some new new literature or new textbook may start to include that also Okay, now let's move on. Now let's talk about what are the causes. What are the causes of low birth weight? Now we have roughly divided low birth weight babies into preterm pre low birth weight and IUGR. So let's talk about what are the causes of premature delivery. They can be spontaneous or they can be induced. Now spontaneous, uh, uh, you know, uh, preterm delivery. It can be because of low socioeconomic status. There are so many problems in low socioeconomic status, female or ladies. Low maternal weight. If somebody's weight is less than 35 kg at the time of pregnancy, there is very high chance they will give premature birth. Chronic and acute maternal illness, any type of chronic and acute maternal illness, like tuberculosis, like heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, any example you can take. Antipartum hemorrhage, APH is antipartum hemorrhage. There are two types of antipartum hemorrhage. I'm sure you have studied this in obstetrics. Okay, placenta previa and abruptio placentae. Especially the abruptio placentae can lead to premature delivery. Cigarette smoking during pregnancy, absolutely harmful for the baby. Baby can suffer from both premature delivery as well as, as well as IUGR. Excessive physical exertion, okay? Excessive physical exertion during pregnancy, that is not good. So we say that lady should take enough rest, okay? She should take enough rest. Especially during third trimester, she must take enough rest. Multiple pregnancy, triplets, okay? Twin or even quadruplet. Now, if you analyze those baby, okay, they look smaller and many of them born, born premature as well. Congenital anomaly in the fetus, any type of congenital anomaly, okay, more commonly, for example, anencephaly, anencephaly, a very important congenital anomaly, the baby may born premature. Bicornot uterus, this is a congenital anomaly of the uterus in that pregnant lady. 
okay there is not enough space inside the uterus so there is chance of premature delivery and very young mother now young mother means if somebody is pregnant before 18 years of age okay 18 then they can also give rise to premature delivery so, so many important causes are there now another one is induced okay induced cause of premature delivery now i can give you few example here the lady is just 32 weeks of gestation but during uh, you know examination by obstetrics the obstetrics found that fetal heart rate is very high okay very high fetal heart rate now we cannot wait for that baby to be mature we need to take that baby out by cesarean section so this is a induced type of premature delivery so if any danger to the baby is there and if we have found out that you know during our examination we may induce the labor and the baby may be born premature that is before 37 weeks of the gestation okay let's move on now this slide is talking about causes of intrauterine growth retardation or iugr okay now we have divided these uh, causes into maternal factor and fetal factors okay maternal factor and fetal factor so let's talk one by one now regarding the maternal factors ladies from low socio economic status can give rise to premature delivery or iugr both regarding the racial and ethnic factors see there indian subcontinent mothers means south asia they uh, usually give rise to a baby's birth weight which are lower to chinese and malaysians this is a difference in race or ethnicity not that much difference but slightly lesser weight now regarding the previous pregnancy history some important point i need to ask okay primary para has higher risk for iugr and we all know what is the meaning of primary para isn't it this is very easy question for you history of previous abortion and still birth there is increased risk of iugr baby and inter pregnancy interval of less than 13 month for example she just gave birth to a baby okay one year ago and immediately okay she became pregnant and like uh, she is giving birth to another now there is a very high chance that that baby will be small because not much enough duration is there and mother has not recovered probably properly these are the different explanation now what are the other if antenatal care is not proper now how many times antenatal visit should be done in pregnancy how many times yes we can answer times. Four, four, four times, times. minimum three times, times. Okay. Four times. okay now now different textbook okay wait different textbook mention there should be minimum four times now one time in each trimester that is very clear there are three trimester in pregnancy once in each trimester and once just before the delivery so four times very easy answer here if somebody doesn't even bother to go to the hospital for antenatal care then we even don't know how the baby is growing inside so this can be listed as one of the cause of iugr regarding the nutritional factors height and weight of the mother matters a lot if height is very less okay for example less than 145 cm and weight less than 35 kg that mother will give rise to iugr baby and even the delivery of that baby will be difficult because she is usually having very narrow pelvic outlet baby cannot come out easily so this type of uh, delivery must be conducted by cesarean section weight gain during pregnancy is another important point if weight gain during pregnancy is less than 7 kg okay now so how we how we determine this when the lady comes to the hospital for antenatal visit for the first time you measure the weight and record it just before the delivery when she comes again you measure the weight and record it then calculate 
whether that weight gain is less than 7 kg or not. Less than 7 kg is a risk factor for IUGR. Means the baby has not grown properly. The size of the baby is small. Maternal malnutrition is a cause of IUGR. Excessive energy expenditure and excessive physical activity is a cause of preterm delivery and IUGR both. Okay, that's why we usually say the pregnant lady should take enough rest, especially in third trimester. And micronutrient deficiency like iron deficiency, vitamin deficiency can also lead to IUGR baby. On the other hand, placental dysfunction, we have studied this topic in detail. This is a very important topic in obstetrics, PIH, okay? It will definitely give rise to IUGR baby because the amount of blood flow towards the baby from placenta would be less. If mother is suffering from chronic systemic disease like hypertension, chronic heart disease, collagen vascular disease like SLE and even long-term diabetes, yesterday we talked about this, chronic diabetes like type 1 or type 2 diabetes, then also there is high chance of IUGR baby birth. Infection in the mother, like urinary tract infection, which should be a chronic one, malaria, and as, as well as tuberculosis and any other chronic illness can also lead to IUGR baby. They can also lead to preterm birth and maternal substance abuse, like smoking, alcohol intake, and any other drug abuse during pregnancy is very harmful for the baby. Both preterm as well as IUGR baby can be born because of this. Now, what about the fetal condition? What about the fetal condition now? See here. Chromosomal disorder like Down syndrome and intrauterine infection like TORCH group of infection. These are two perfect example here. That type of baby are also IUGR baby. Okay. So this is, these are the very important discussion. I'm sure you must have studied this from obstetrics also. Even if you have not studied there, okay, uh, now you know what are these factors. Now, let's go to the uh, more important uh, part than these causes. What are the hallmarks of preterm low birth weight baby? How do we diagnose it? How do we diagnose this baby during examination? In the last semester, when we talk about pediatric practical, we talk something about this. Okay, now see here. The crown heel length, okay, the crown heel length is, is also known as length of the baby. Length of the baby is usually less than 47 centimeter. Head circumference is usually less than 33 centimeter, okay, and it exceeds chest circumference by 3 centimeter. Means still the head is smaller but still it exceeds the chest circumference by more than three centimeters. Now, a normal full-term infant is having crown heel length of 50 centimeter and head circumference of 35 centimeter, okay? So this is how you compare the things. Now, activity is poor. These babies are, these babies look inactive. These babies look lethargic, okay? They, they don't move much, poor reflexes, and okay, incomplete type of reflex. There is one important reflex which we do all the time in the newborn baby, and this is called moro reflex. Okay, this is called moro reflex. Let me write you the name here: moro reflex. Now, when you do or elicit this moro reflex in that a premature baby. There will be incomplete response. And in case of full term healthy baby, there will be a complete response. The face looks small, the sutures widely separated, the fontanelles are large, especially the anterior and posterior fontanelle. There will be a small chin and protruding eye because of shallow orbit. Uh, in one sentence, overall, this baby looks very immature. Okay, the baby uh, has not developed any maturity at all. Let's move on. 
now let's let's uh, you know uh, look at this picture here okay see this this way we it looks very immature even on the first look the eye ball or uh, socket looks very shallow okay uh, the hair on the scalp looks very immature and most of the other other things we cannot see properly like genitalia or sole crease and things like that even nipple uh, nodules cannot be seen here but still from the facial appearance this baby looks very premature now if you examine the ear the ear cartilage is deficient here okay ear cartilage is deficient or not uh, properly developed you can say so when you when you fold the pinna just go to the baby and fold the pinna then quickly release it if you do that there will be very poor recoil because the cartilage is not properly developed so very poor recoil on folding the pinna hair appears very woolly and individual hair fibers can be seen separately this is not like a, a mature tom infant in that the hair looks a bit denser okay this it is very very uh, scattered uh, hair in the preterm baby His skin looks quite thin and gelatinous as well as shiny because it is very thin so underlying blood vessels can be seen and uh, there will be abundant lanugo and very little vernix caseosa now lanugo and vernix caseosa i'm sure student still remember okay can i ask what is lanugo and what is what is vernix caseosa anybody no lanugo here yeah. present on the body of the baby and vernix caseosa is the white thing gelatinous material present on the surface of body it prevent the baby from <clears throat> hypothermia okay yes uh, uh, rana etisham also wants to speak so what is what is lanugo and what happens to the lanugo what is the difference in preterm and full term baby yes small thin hairs are present on body uh huh okay that is called mm -hmm. lanugo okay fine both of them mujib and rana etisham both are right actually so lanugo means this is a baby hair okay just remember this is baby hair okay and this baby here is more abundant if they are born prematurely and vernix caseosa is a bit of opposite thing now it is a white substance which is sticking on the surface of the baby at the time of birth more mature the baby more vernix caseosa more premature the baby less vernix caseosa so this is the relation and this vernix uh, helps the baby to prevent from hypothermia another important point is regarding the testes this testes remain undescended in case of a very premature baby because when the baby reaches full term then the testes starts to descend so we don't need to worry about this for example if the baby is born at 32 weeks of gestation there is still 6 week left for that baby to be matured okay so you don't need to worry his 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 uh, scrotum is empty there are no testicles present in the scrotum at that time but you already know the testicles will descend later on so accordingly parents should be counseled otherwise they they would be you know a bit anxious what's going on to my baby something like that the scrotum is poorly formed there is no proper rugosities of the scrotum and in uh, a full term baby the scrotum rugosities are well formed this is a very important difference and in case of female baby the labia majora are widely separated okay this is a feature of preterm baby so these are important question okay so please revise this uh, if you are not sure okay let's move on now another important part is what are the problems of this preterm low birth weight baby why we worry if a preterm low birth weight baby is born in the hospital now the reason is almost the whole body is premature or immature in them okay so there are lots of problems in this type of baby so let's talk uh, one after other 
now in the respiratory system this baby suffer from respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity this rds is respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity also known as hyaline membrane disease hmd okay hyaline membrane disease okay see here hyaline membrane disease hmd so these are synonymous term and this hyaline membrane disease you all know is because of lack of surfactant surfactant isn't it lack of surfactant now let me say a little bit more about this this surfactant starts to form at 34 weeks of gestation okay so lack of surfactant would be there if a baby is born before 34 weeks okay before 34 weeks these are important points now one small discussion here maybe many of the students already know what is the function of surfactant now that surfactant is necessary to decrease the surface tension inside the alveoli we we have to decrease the surface tension then only those alveoli will remain open okay now this baby is born now baby starts to take breath if because of lack of surfactant those alveoli are not opening then the baby will be breathless the baby will suffer from respiratory distress syndrome and this is called respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity now still i have not explain why it is called hyaline membrane disease now listen carefully if we take a biopsy from this alveoli or from this type of lung and study under the microscope we can see a pink substance which is deposited inside this alveoli this is called hyaline membrane because of this we call this disease as a hyaline membrane disease now another one is apnea of a prematurity okay apnea of prematurity now in the last class i mean uh, the class when we talk about neonatal resuscitation we clearly define what is apnea so apnea anybody can tell me what is apnea stoppage of breathing more than 20 seconds more than 20 seconds stoppage of breathing more than 20 seconds okay wait wait let me choose some of the student because many students name i can see there okay ek yes saif can you tell me what is apnea yes sir so when a baby stop breathing for more than 20 seconds good i mean i mean eli can you tell me the second part of the definition there is two two component there yes sir uh, i only remember that one <laughs> okay who can tell me the second part sir with the sinus like tachycardia and hypotension yes sir okay sorry, what, the wait, wait 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 let me take the name okay yes adil adil is saying something continue yes the sedation of breath uh, not more than 20 seconds but uh, with the sinus symptom like hypotension and bradycardia ek sadat sadat was also trying to say something can you can you you know tell your answer uh, yes sir the stoppage of breathing not more than 20 second but we are defining symptom the bradycardia hypotension so very good both of them actually all of you are absolutely correct Uh, apnea of prematurity this baby is prematurely born before 37 weeks of gestation and there are two wings of definition in apnea one if cessation is more than 20 second you don't need any other definition at all this is apnea but it doesn't always happen like that sometimes the cessation is about 5 second 8 second 10 second or 15 second but if that occurs with bradycardia okay with cyanosis or even pallor or hypotonia then also it is called apnea this is very very common in premature baby because the central uh, you know you know the control center i should say of respiration which is in medulla is not properly developed now another important problem in respiratory system is bronchopulmonary dysplasia now listen carefully it also needs a bit of explanation here now these babies usually suffer from respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity because of lack of the surfactant so what we are going to do regarding the treatment for this baby okay 
we are going to admit this baby in the hospital and probably we need to intubate them okay we need to intubate them and keep this baby in mechanical ventilator mechanical ventilator now to treat this lack of surfactant you have to give surfactant you have to give surfactant through the tube okay will will in will push that surfactant through the endotracheal tube so that surfactant will go inside the lung and it start to work now this baby need a long time of hospitalization we cannot take them out of the ventilator or tube very quickly so as a result of this the whole respiratory tract of this babies are remodeled okay this is called remodeled this condition is known as bronchopulmonary dysplasia as a result of this when this baby becomes older okay becomes kid a lot of problem can happen like bronchial asthma like reactive airway disease recurrent chest infection and all these things so try to remember these things okay wait some of the students want to join so let me allow them okay fine now the another type of uh, problems in preterm low birth weight baby are uh, neurologic now neurologic means uh, regarding the central nervous system these babies are very inactive okay they have poor sucking they cannot suck on mother's milk especially if they are born before 32 weeks of gestation and they cannot even swallow properly because the swallowing reflex is not developed and it is very difficult to feed them what we have got certain way to feed them and that is by nasogastric tube or ng tube another important a problem is intracranial hemorrhage that is because of deficiency of vitamin k and if vitamin k is deficient the vitamin k dependent factors like 2 7 9 and 10 will be deficient resulting in easy hemorrhage inside the brain in other parts of the body as well so to prevent from this complication or problem we have to quickly give vitamin k in these babies regarding the cardiovascular uh, a problem okay regarding the cardiovascular problem now see here let me explain with the help of you know some underline in something like that pda okay patent doctors arteriosus okay can happen in this preterm baby one third of the baby who are born before 34 weeks shows clinical evidence of pda with or without congestive cardiac failure so patent doctor's arteriosus is one of the very important problem in a premature baby now you have already studied pda in pediatrics in cardiovascular system this pda is a connection between pulmonary artery and aorta and the direction of blood flow after the birth is from aorta to the pulmonary artery so the lung will be flooded by excessive blood flow and that can easily lead to a lot of problem like repeated pneumonia okay even the heart failure can occur now we have we have got certain treatment for pda and every student can can answer so let 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 me not ask that okay i am sure all of you know this answer in the beginning we give indomethacin if that doesn't work we have to go for surgery now what about the hematological problems in that preterm low birth weight baby they quickly suffer from anemia and they also suffer from hyperbilirubinemia okay both are very common and in the class of neonatal jaundice i clearly told you even with very low amount of bilirubin level than full term baby this baby can develop complication so phototherapy and exchange blood transfusion should be done okay we are talking about the problems of preterm low birth weight baby and before the break what are the cardiovascular problems of preterm low birth baby we have talked about that that is uh, pda okay 
patent doctor's arteriosus, which is quite common in almost one third of the baby who born before 34 weeks of gestation. Now, regarding the hematological problems or complication, anemia and jaundice, known as hyperbilirubinemia, are very common. Now, this hyperbilirubinemia is mainly a cause by immaturity of the enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase. So it cannot conjugate on conjugated bilirubin into the conjugated one. And anemia is mainly because of low stores of the iron or less stores of the iron because the baby is born quite early and iron transfer from the mother towards the baby occurs in third trimester usually. So because of the you know premature delivery, anemia is quite common. GI complication is necrotizing enterocolitis. Now, I like to discuss this uh, in a bit detail here. Okay, this is a very important one. Okay, now see here. Now, this necrotizing enterocolitis or neck occurs when, okay, when this baby is fed with formula. Okay, now formula feeding uh, has higher amount of protein. It has got high protein. Now, in comparison to the breast milk. Now, this baby cannot, you know, uh, uh, digest this high protein. And this protein acts like a antigen there, okay? It acts like a antigen. So at the same time, it can damage, damage, okay? Can damage the, the mucosa, damage the mucosa of GI tract. So because of this, if there are some microorganisms which are already colonized, they can easily enter into the circulation from the mucosa and can lead to sepsis. This whole picture is known as necrotizing enterocolitis. Now remember, if this premature baby are only fed mother's milk or breast milk, the chances of necrotizing enterocolitis are almost nil. But especially if they are fed with formula, this thing can happen. Okay, so let's move on. Now, other co problems or complications of preterm low birth with babies are metabolic, like hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia. Now, hypoglycemia is very common in them, okay, because they are small overall, all the organs are small, even liver is small. So the amount of glycogen which is stored in the liver will be less. So that itself is a cause of hypoglycemia. Another one, this baby cannot suck properly. They cannot feed properly. So if a slight amount of negligence occurs during feeding process, they can quickly develop hypoglycemia. Okay. Another is hypocalcemia. Now the calcium transfer from mother to the baby occurs in third trimester again. So if they are born prematurely, that cannot happen properly. Regarding the renal, renal uh, uh, problems or complications of premature baby, okay, there is low GFR. So low GFR, as a result of that, blood urea nitrogen is high. Or low GFR, so that the filtration cannot occur properly. So whatever blood urea nitrogen is there in the blood, it will remain there, quite easy explanation. And another one, they uh, have not yet developed the concentrating ability of the tubules well. So without the concentrating ability of the tubules, more fluid will be lost from the tubules, which results in easy dehydration. In other words, they need more IV fluid than the full term baby. In comparison, these preterm baby need more fluid. Another problem may be poor thermoregulation. What does that mean? They cannot regulate the heat which is generated inside the body. Number one, the heat can be lost quickly. And another point, they cannot even generate proper heat. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Why these things occur? There is a you know, large surface area in case of premature baby. Okay. Second point, the subcutaneous fat is very, very less. So they cannot 
insulinate themselves they can quickly uh, you know dissipate heat from their body so quick heat loss is a problem second one because of very less amount of brown fat in them they cannot generate heat so generation is less and loss is more so this baby can quickly develop hypothermia and hypothermia is a very very serious problem in the preterm baby now because of this this preterm baby has to be taken care inside the incubator when you go to the you know neonatal ward or pediatric ward you can see a box even in the last semester if you remember in our you know in our lab uh, there was a incubator kept there okay and some of the students were very eagerly asking what is that that is the incubator and we put or keep this preterm baby inside that box and maintain the temperature other problem would be they are deficient in both humoral and cellular immunity so infection is quite common in them and inside the eye retinopathy of prematurity can also occur especially if they are born before 32 week or if they are less than 1500 g and this retinopathy of prematurity mainly occurs if we give very high concentration of oxygen to those baby even if they don't need it oxygen is causing a lot of damage in the retina that's why if it is not necessary don't give oxygen as such okay now let's move on maybe some of the students want to join okay fine now now after uh, discussing the problems of preterm baby uh, let's talk about iugr or intrauterine growth retardation what are the problem and what are the types now, there are two types of iugr baby they are asymmetric and symmetrical iugr okay so let's differentiate them first and then talk about the problem now asymmetric iugr means the fetus gets malnourished during later part of the pregnancy especially in third trimester okay they get malnourished because of placental dysfunction that's the most common cause of asymmetrical iugr and the important cause of placental dysfunction is pregnancy induced hypotension or pih you can also call that preeclampsia they have reduction of cell size okay cells number may be normal but those sizes of the cells are reduced that's why they are growth retarded they looks thin long and marasmic remember marasmus and quasi worker we have studied under severe malnutrition this asymmetrical iugr baby almost looks like a marasmic baby now think about the marasmus those marasmic baby have they don't have any subcutaneous fat okay they they have only skin and bone on their body and they look like a very old man or old person than their age same type of features will be seen in asymmetrical iugr baby okay so let me highlight the important points here they look thin long and marasmic and they have no subcutaneous fat this is very important point now another important point here is the brain growth is unaffected means the size of the brain is still like a normal baby so because of this this brain can utilize you know high amount of glucose so the glucose demand is high in asymmetrical iugr just like normal full term baby but the storage form of glucose in the form of glycogen is less because liver size is already you know contracted liver is small so the store is less but the demand is high that's why this asymmetrical iugr baby can quickly develop hypoglycemia even much more commonly than preterm babies head circumference is more than 3 cm than chest circumference it's less just like preterm baby and ponderal index okay this is a very very important point ponderal index is less than 2 and this is the way we calculate ponderal index that is weight in gram divided by length in centimeter q okay centimeter q multiply by 100 weight in gram divided by length in centimeter q multiply by 
and if this ponderable index is less than 2 it shows asymmetrical iugr now let's talk about a uh, symmetrical iugr after looking these pictures you see here how the baby looks look at this skin yeah wrinkled already the skins are wrinkled that means there is no subcutaneous fat okay this baby is even even more comparison between normal and iugr baby this is iugr baby this is normal baby okay this iugr baby has a lot of folds on the buttock just like a marasmic baby the skin is looks very thin and you know uh, a relaxing type okay because there is no subcutaneous fat now what about symmetric iugr what's the differences the symmetric iugr baby okay the symmetric iugr baby has also reduction in cell number and this reduction in cell number occurs because they are affected from early pregnancy okay they uh, affected from early pregnancy now let's let's quickly uh, compare uh, uh, regarding the cell number here in asymmetrical iugr the size of the cells are decreased but the numbers may be the same but in symmetrical iugr because they are affected from much earlier pregnancy period the cell number itself is decreased this means the overall size of the symmetrical iugr baby is small they look much smaller than asymmetrical iugr and the common causes may be intrauterine infection and chromosomal disorder because they can occur from the early pregnancy okay they are proportionately small in all parameter head circumference is small chest circumference is small overall length is smaller and overall size of the body is small and in this condition if we calculate ponderal index it is still more than 2 remember less than 2 in asymmetrical iugr more than 2 in symmetrical iugr okay now uh, let's talk about uh, something more now we have talked about the problems of low birth weight baby or a premature low birth weight baby now let's talk the problems of uh, small for gestational age or iugr baby what are the differences there is chance of congenital malformation in case of iugr baby because you have to answer this first why are they iugr baby in the first place most probably they are having a lot of problem inside the uterus so because of those problem congenital malformations are quite common this is a very easy understanding they suffer from severe birth asphyxia especially at the time of birth okay because they already are hypoxic inside the uterus and at the time of birth even more birth asphyxia can occur now remember because of this birth asphyxia they are usually polycythemic as well meconium aspiration syndrome is very common in sga baby now in that class though i have not taken this class uh, you know live but a few weeks ago i have already given slides and probably my audio recording also to you and during that time if you have heard or listened okay i have clearly explained meconium is passed inside the uterus okay if the baby is hypoxic there the hypoxia will lead to passage of meconium now same thing is happening here the baby has already passed meconium and that meconium okay is present in the amniotic fluid now at the time of birth okay that amniotic fluid is everywhere in the baby's mouth and even in the airway or in the gi tract so it can be easily aspirated hypothermia and hypoglycemia commonly occurs in sga babies as well but hypoglycemia uh, is much more common than in preterm baby i have already explained you the reason so let me highlight again this hypoglycemia is a very important point okay it is also uh, you know denoted by red uh, red color here pulmonary hemorrhage can occur and polycythemia is very common feature due to chronic hypoxia in this baby they have very poor growth potential on follow up they can okay they can uh, you know catch the normal newborns of the same age 
by two years of age it will take almost two years to catch the normal full term baby of the same age they are quite vulnerable to infection and very very important point there is increased risk of development of type 2 diabetes hypertension and coronary artery disease in later life if you are born with iugr baby now i want to say a bit more about this a person okay known as barker did a lot of research in this so this is a uh, known as barker hypothesis so let me write this for you okay barker hypothesis okay so what what he did so he has okay uh, found out the patient with type 2 diabetes hypertension and coronary artery disease so it is just like a retrospective study so he went back he went backwards okay and he uh, was looking at the files when these babies were delivered what was the condition of them were they full term baby were they preterm baby or were they iugr baby and he found out one very significant point most of those babies were iugr baby and according to that result he formulated his hypothesis so this is called barker hypothesis so let me uh, revise once again if a baby is born iugr and later on when that uh, person become adult there is high risk of development of type 2 diabetes hypertension or coronary artery disease okay now this uh, you know uh, uh, table is comparing the problems of preterm baby and iugr or small for gestational age baby now share the chances of intrauterine hypoxia is much more in sga babies than the preterm baby okay birth asphyxia is again much more higher in iugr or sga babies than preterm baby because uh, let's go to the causes of sga or iugr that causes itself enough to explain intrauterine aspiration a part of meconium aspiration is much more common in sga again hyaline membrane disease never occurs in sga babies because they are already fully mature the surfactant is already developed in them they are only seen in preterm low birth weight baby apneic attack are again seen in preterm baby because the respiratory center is well developed in small for gestational age baby because they are full term inability to suck and swallow of course in preterm baby especially if they are born very premature okay not not like 36 week or 35 week they if they are born before 32 week then that can be a possibility during feeding aspiration commonly occurs in preterm baby because they don't develop swallowing reflex okay without swallowing reflex they cannot uh, you know swallow the milk so aspiration is quite frequent whereas sga or iugr baby they don't have that uh, typical problem necrotizing enterocolitis is much more commonly seen in preterm low birth weight baby than sga baby remember what i told you okay high protein milk should be fed to those baby then necrotizing enterocolitis can be there okay so there is a possibility sga babies can also develop that if they are fed that type of milk but it is very common in preterm babies now let's talk some other a uh, differences symptomatic hypoglycemia much more common in sga baby definitely so many times i have explained that reason this is because of the differences in size of brain and liver the size of brain especially if it is asymmetrical iugr it is still normal but size of liver is very shrunken as a result of that demand of glucose is high but supply of glucose will be less that's why there is high chance of hypoglycemia preterm baby can also develop hypoglycemia we are just comparing it you know that's why it is written 3 plus here and only 1 plus on this side hypothermia more common in preterm baby than sga baby okay because of the lack of brown fat so that they cannot generate heat at the same time because of 
large body surface area, they can lose heat effectively. Whereas in SJ babies, okay, probably they are generating good amount of heat. Okay, though they don't have enough subcutaneous fat, the generation will will be important here. Polycythemia more common in SJ babies than in preterm. Hyperbilirubinemia or neonatal jaundice, okay, more common in preterm baby now because that enzyme which is responsible for okay a conjugation is not properly developed in preterm baby. Infection again more common in preterm baby than in SJ baby, but in SJ also it can happen. Congenital malformation much more common in SJ babies because at the time of development some problems was already happening. Intraventricular hemorrhage more common in preterm because those blood vessels are fragile in them. Just like any other tissue, the blood vessels are also not properly developed. And pulmonary hemorrhage is more common in the other type now, okay? So these are some of the important point, but from the exam point of view, we love to ask about hypoglycemia. Don't forget that. I've explained that many times. Neonatal jaundice or hyperbilirubinemia and polycythemia, okay? So you can easily give reasons for them. Now, what is the prognosis of these babies? Prognosis of these low birth weight baby. What is happening uh, to them? Okay, when they become bigger. Now, the immediate problem, okay, and future problem. Let's talk about that one after the, okay. The immediate problem uh, in preterm low birth weight baby is high mortality, especially if they are born very prematurely. Now, our developing countries don't have enough facilities for the care of these uh, very premature baby, especially if they are born before 32 weeks, we just give up, you know, we, we just say, uh, those babies can't survive, so the the care which is provided inside the hospital is not that good enough. But in developed countries, okay, they take care of these babies very well. So babies even up to 28 weeks can still survive if you give good facility. This is very, very important point. Now, regarding small for date, this is another term for small for gestational age, also known as small for date. That is better, but increased when compared with normally grown babies. Okay, means the problems are more in comparison to normally grown babies. Now, what happens regarding the future physical and mental development? In preterm low birth weight baby, it is good if no perinatal complications occur. But in small for date or small for gestational age baby, it is poor if symmetrical IUGR and severe IUGR, because they have been affected from first trimester itself. They are already very small regarding everything. But if they are asymmetrical IUGR, there is increased risk of hypertension, coronary artery disease, and diabetes mellitus type two. So we have already talked about this. Now, what about the major neurosensory handicapped condition, which is a part of long-term outcome of preterm low birth weight babies, okay? These are mainly seen in preterm low birth weight baby. Uh, there are uh, certain important points here, so let me explain. Now, the first of them is called cerebral palsy. Now, you have heard this term when we talk about de developmental milestone, cerebral palsy. So, let me explain this. Please mute yourself. You are, you are causing disturbance to all of us. Cerebral palsy is called, it's a group of neurological disorder that appear in infancy or early childhood and permanently affect the body movement, muscle coordination and balance. Now let me make it easy for you. you know, this is a special you know, definition and uh, we have to follow the book definition many of the time, isn't it? Okay. So, now I'll ban this person who talks, okay? Please, 
when when we are discussing do not talk in between this this is badly disturbing all of us now cerebral palsy means it's a group of neurological disorder that appear in infancy or early childhood and it permanently affect the body movement muscle coordination and balance now when the brain is developing okay if something happens during that time maybe some congenital anomaly maybe some infection or maybe some other disease it may badly damage the development of mainly the motor system now look at this term here body movement muscle coordination and balance these all are functions of motor system so cerebral palsy is mainly concerned with development of the motor system and it is not progressing after that whatever has developed it will remain like this so this condition is known as cerebral palsy so it affects the part of the brain that controls muscle movement and almost 40% of all cerebral palsy child are born preterm or premature and one more point in very low birth weight babies okay the prevalence reaches almost 6 to 10% you don't need to remember this percentage actually but just just know the concept the cerebral palsy is one of the major problem in preterm baby another one is mental retardation okay the iq level falls when this baby become older another is hearing impairment now they they have some problem in hearing this baby when they become bigger and start going to school that time it may be diagnosed okay and that is exacerbated by if we give some autotoxic drug during the neonatal life for example they are sick they are having sepsis and you have given autotoxic drug during the treatment can you tell me some of the autotoxic drug please anyone amino glycosides amino glycosides okay amino good amino glycoside fusamide very good even chloroquine and even aspirin okay these all are considered uh, autotoxic drug now if we give this during the treatment of some of the problem in neonatal life okay or even infantile life later on uh, they can develop hearing impairment the problem of preterm baby is separate they can develop hearing impairment even without anything on top of that if we have this problem then the chances will be still more that's what i'm trying to say here another is hypoxia ischemia okay excessive bilirubin deposition which can cause hearing loss if the neonate develop jaundice and if it is not properly treated it can damage the brain and incubator noise if the baby is kept for long time inside the incubator then also okay then also the hearing impairment may be there now share even i can be damage we call that retinopathy of prematurity rop retinopathy of prematurity very easy term now in very low birth weight baby the the incidence can reach up to 20 to 25 percent this is very high percentage one fourth of very low birth weight baby develop that particular problem okay but in extremely low birth weight baby the percentage is almost double 40 to 50 percent and one of the important point i like to highlight here is the use of high concentrated oxygen if we give pure and 100% oxygen unnecessarily now why i am using that term unnecessarily please remember this if those babies are hypoxic we have to give oxygen there is no other way oxygen is necessary there but unnecessarily if you want to raise the oxygen percentage in that in that infant to 100% keeping around 95% would be enough but if you want to keep that oxygen concentration to 100% by pulse oximetry then it can cause some serious damage to those baby especially if they are premature that is the meaning and the baby may become blind because of retinopathy of prematurity but treatment is available and that is laser therapy another important long term outcome of preterm low birth weight baby would be hydrocephalus this is called progressive hydrocephalus and this occur because of hemorrhage 
okay inside the ventricle of the brain now what happens if hemorrhage occur inside the ventricle how can it lead to hydrocephalus anybody so the blood will the blood will be accumulated in the ventricle cell so it will lead to hydrocephalus because the csf it will block the flow of csf okay okay fine any other any other want to say any other student rana etisam are you there yes sir so what is your opinion why why uh, intraventricular hemorrhage can lead to hydrocephalus maybe sir compression of uh, flow of uh, saliva okay okay now any 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 other Clot please for, yes yes sir clot clot, clot formation will block the flow the pressure. Pressure. wait 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 one by one one by one yes sunny uh, sir uh, there will be clot formation so they will block the uh, flow of csf okay where, where is that uh, obstruction will be in which area can i uh, can i say sir, sir in the foramen mandro uh, ventricles okay wait cerebral wait. aqueduct Okay, cerebral aqueduct. Yes, Sadat, what is your opinion? Yes, sir. sir. I say there is clot formation and it will block the cerebral aqueduct, so big pressure will develop and they will lead to hydrocephalus. Very good. You know, most of the most of you are are uh, telling the correct answer. You know, there are different different area where it can ah, block. Okay? Where it can block. Exactly, different area. So all of those answers. Uh, can be accepted but listen carefully because i cannot ask all the students here okay because there will be a lot of noise otherwise so other students listen the explanation if hemorrhage is occurring inside the lateral ventricle that blood okay may obstruct by forming a clot okay by forming a clot it may block foramen of monro that is one area if it goes out of that it may form a clot and block cerebral aqueduct and another one if it goes outside the fourth ventricle it will block the absorption site of the csf okay nobody tell me that it it blocks the absorption site of the csf as well so it depends whether it is a communicating hydrocephalus or non communicating one in the first two example which i gave if foramen of monro is obstructed or blocked and cerebral aqueduct is blocked this is called obstructive hydrocephalus and the last example if the absorption site of the csf is blocked by the clot then communicating hydrocephalus will be developed now this hydrocephalus can badly uh, uh, affect the functions of brain and can result in mental retardation later on okay so good evening everyone so let's uh, continue whatever we are talking yesterday we're talking about preterm low birth weight and iugr baby and the different problems of them okay and how to manage now right now we're talking about what are the long term outcome of preterm low birth weight baby yesterday we talk about certain important long term outcome like cerebral palsy okay uh, hearing impairment retinopathy of prematurity progressive hydrocephalus and things like that so today some other uh, problems let's talk about there are some minor handicapped condition like impaired cognitive development this cognition is also related to uh, memory isn't it memory or the functions of frontal lobe of the brain so it is also a bit about iq so sometimes this preterm baby or very low birth weight or extremely low birth weight baby when they become bigger their iq level slightly suffers impaired language development and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder all of these are associated with uh, a brain damage which they have suffered very early in life if they have not suffered anything then probably uh, the brain development is just like any other normal baby another problem which may happen in them okay is chronic lung disease and we already talked about that that is called bronchopulmonary dysplasia 
that bronchopulmonary dysplasia means this baby uh, this type of babies i should say they are having respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity or highly in membrane disease so to treat for this condition we need to intubate them and keep under mechanical ventilator for a long time so with that effect the airway the whole airway will be remodeled and later on they can have a lot of problem because of that that is called bronchopulmonary dysplasia now preterm babies catch up in their physical growth with full term counterparts by the age of 1 to 2 years so they are a bit slow okay they need up to 2 years to catch up with the full term baby so they remain smaller for quite a bit of time and there is increased rate of post neonatal illness and hospitalization in preterm baby because of a decrease immunity in them because of all those factor which we have discussed before now on the other hand what is the outcome of sga okay or iugr baby now they are better than preterm of the identical weight now i'll give you one example here one baby is born at 34 weeks of gestation and he is 2 kg another baby is born at 39 weeks of gestation he is also 2 kg now the second one is a full term baby isn't it but the weight is low now that baby is called sga or iugr baby because of the mature or maturity i should say the second baby has much better prognosis or outcome than the first mortality is 2 to 3 times of aga of identical maturity but in comparison to appropriate for gestational age baby the mortality is more in sga babies fine they are better than preterm but they are not better than aga in fact the mortality rate is 2 to 3 times more than aga or appropriate for gestational age of identical maturity i'm sure you still remember what is the meaning of sga aga and lga from yesterday's discussion okay let me quickly remind you now we have got one graph okay on y axis of that graph there is weight on x axis there is gestational age and there are two lines there the upper line is 90 percentile lower one is 10 percentile if a weight of the baby falls between those two line it is aga if it falls above than the upper line lga and if it falls below than the lower line it is sga that is a very simple a uh, meaning the body weight of sga babies at 2 year is about 10% lower as compared to aga babies not that much difference just 10% because they are born smaller so they take time to catch up like a normal one and one more important point yesterday also i talked about it symmetrical iugr baby remain physically and mentally handicapped than asymmetrically iugr baby now the reason is the symmetrically iugr baby are suffering right from the first trimester of pregnancy when organogenesis is going on they are suffering from right that time but asymmetrical iugr baby suffer more during the third trimester only everything is already formed probably developed by that time so they are much less affected physically and mentally than symmetrical iugr baby now this is the last part of this big topic so let's talk about how to manage or take care of a uh, a low birth weight babies okay so let me uh, you know discuss this in a in a good way now first thing is prevention now first thing is prevention of low birth weight now yes especially the preterm delivery can be prevented okay for example if a lady at 32 weeks of gestation comes to the hospital with with some signs of 
liver or some symptoms of liver we must admit her in the hospital and we should arrest that premature liver now can anyone tell me which are those drug which we give to arrest the premature liver yes which drug we give to arrest the premature liver yes yes salbutamol okay okay then you are right okay you are right salbutamol group of drugs you can say like that salbutamol group of drugs okay uh, like salbutamol turbutalin ritodrin and isosuprene they all are tocolytic agent it is called tocolytic agent because they relax the uterus they don't allow uterus to contract that is the meaning so we should give them to arrest the premature labor another important uh, type of management is antenatal corticosteroid okay antenatal corticosteroid dexamethasone or betamethasone okay dexamethasone or betamethasone can be given but they should be given around 12 hours ago for the optimal effect at least 12 hour gap should be there before the delivery and the last dose of corticosteroid now why we give them they will help the maturation of surfactant in the newborn okay by the time the newborn is born he will born with good amount of surfactant and that will really help okay to fight against the respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity these are the very very important point now at birth what can we do to take proper care of these preterm low birth weight babies delayed cord clamping to increase the iron store now some of the doctors they don't believe this type of management they think if we delay the cord clamping a lot of blood will go towards the baby and that can lead to hypervolemia okay sometimes it can lead to polycythemia as well so it depends it has some certain advantages and certain disadvantages so you should weigh what is your benefit and risk and the advantage is it is increasing the iron store in that baby we should promptly dry and cover the baby because of the large surface area this baby can quickly lose heat and develop hypothermia so this is a very very important step okay we should always remember this another one keep the baby under radiant warmer okay keep the baby under radiant warmer just to prevent the baby from getting hypothermic give vitamin k as soon as possible because they are very high risk of deficiency of vitamin k and vitamin k deficiency can lead to intracranial hemorrhage which is a very serious problem transfer to nursery as soon as possible okay transfer to nursery now nursery is the a little bit specialized area there are uh, many babies like that and the nurses are also very experienced so you should give certain care there for example what is the blood sugar of that baby i want to know that can be easily done in nursery they can keep this baby inside the incubator they can give iv fluid to the baby they can give feeding to the baby so all these things can be done now how to maintain thermal control in that newborn maintain thermo neutral environment now what is the meaning of this thermo neutral environment means we should maintain that temperature where the basal metabolism is minimum okay minimum means the baby doesn't use much energy this is called thermo neutral environment and to maintain that thermo neutral environment we need to maintain the core temperature at 36.5 degree to 37 degree centigrade now if we if we uh, maintain this core temperature you know the thermo neutral environment would be maintained now what i mean here okay don't get confused we constantly measure the temperature of the newborn and we adjust the environmental temperature by the time baby attains this temperature in the body 
we maintain that environmental temperature. In this case, incubator is the environment. So we adjust temperature of the environment uh, incubator till the baby reaches this temperature. That is the meaning. Now, humidity inside the incubator is maintained at 40 to 60 percent. Okay, humidity to prevent heat loss, to prevent irritation, okay, and drying of the respiratory passages. Humidity should be maintained, otherwise, the air or the environment will be very dry. Now, what are the other uh, steps of the management? Now, oxygen therapy must be balanced against the risk of damage to the eye, especially retina. Yesterday, I told this point so many times in the discussion. Oxygen should be given only if it is necessary. Let's take an example here. If the baby is having respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity, we must give oxygen. There's no doubt about it. But what is the oxygen saturation we need to maintain? That is the question. And oxygen saturation is enough if it is maintained around 95%. Don't try to take it to 100%. That is not necessary. And to, to do that, you need to give large amount of oxygen, which will damage the eye of the baby, especially if that baby is very premature. This is called retinopathy of prematurity. Phototherapy should be started quite early if the baby develops jaundice because this is a preterm baby. Jaundice can you know, uh, increase very, very fast and it can lead to chronic terrace as well. Prevention of nosocomial infection is an important uh, you know, step in nurse, nursery care. Now, how can we do that? Okay. The important way to do this, see here, there are different babies inside the nursery. So the nurse who is taking care of one baby should wash hands thoroughly before she takes care of the another baby. Same principle applies to the doctor as well. This is very, very important one. Prevent the cross infection from one baby to the other. And enough fluid should be given to this newborn baby. Now, how much fluid the baby requires? Okay, now see here. Okay, now look at this slide. These are the requirements of fluid in the newborn baby. Now, you don't need to know this uh, exactly like this now. Just, I want to give you some concept here, okay? When you start working as a doctor, these things will be very easy for you. You can straight away look at the different guidelines and then prescribe the fluid. Now, if weight is more than 1500 gram, okay, in day one and two, 80 ml per kg per day. Day three to 15 or up to two weeks, it is 110 ml per kg per day and more than 15, 130 ml per kg per day. Now, see here, if weight is more than 1250, Okay, uh, 90 ml, 120 ml, and 130 ml, and weight more than 1 kg. Okay, one this is 1 kg, 100 ml, 130, and, and 140. Now, one important information you got from this lesser the weight, more requirement of the fluid. Now see this this baby is just 1 kg, this baby is already 1.5 kg. Look at the requirement of the fluid in first day, 80 ml per kg per day, here 100 ml per kg per day. Because lower the weight, more is the body surface area and more fluid the baby can lose. So we need to give more fluid from outside. Now, how to feed the baby? This is a big problem because Many of the baby, they are born very prematurely and they cannot suck on mother's breast properly and they don't have even the good swallow reflex. So there are lots of problems, okay? They have poor gag reflex as well, so they can aspirate the milk and aspiration pneumonia can happen. So 
the person who feeds the baby, especially the nurses, should be very experienced. And another thing, their GI tract is also not very mature. There are very a decreased amount of enzyme secretion. So all these things has to be considered before feeding the baby. So if you are in doubt, give IV fluid for certain days. Start with very little amount of milk, maybe 2 ml every 2 hour or 4 ml to 5 ml every 2 hour. And if the baby can digest it without any problem, increase the amount of milk in next feeding. This has to be done. Don't give, uh, you know, at the volume of 10 to 20 ml in the beginning. The baby cannot handle that much right at the beginning. Uh, it has to be increased slowly. Oral feeding not to be given before 34 weeks because uh, the baby cannot swallow. Or it should not be given with respiratory distress, with sepsis, with central nervous system depression, like in coma, or if the baby is having shock or circulatory insufficiency, because there is high chance of aspiration in this type of situation. So oral feeding should not be given at all before 34 weeks, or even after 34 weeks with this problem. We should wait. We should give IV fluid. Wait for this condition to settle then you start the oral feeding. Now, what is the meaning of trophic feeding? Trophic means, okay, trophic means we stimulate the GI tract by giving very small volume of feed. This is stimulatory feed for the GI tract. So probably it is given in the volume of 2 to 4 ml of, you know, of per time. And that time is every two hours. So it stimulates GI tract and improves the level of gut hormone. It enhances motility, so there is less feeding intolerance. So GI tract will be stimulated. There will be peristaltic movement, so the baby will start to digest the milk. Another important thing, it will also decrease the need of parenteral nutrition and there will be fewer episodes of sepsis if trophic feeding is started very early. Now parenteral nutrition means intravenous nutrition. Now we cannot give this uh, forever. Uh, maybe for a few days parenteral nutrition is fine but after that duration the GI tract should be made ready and then we should start the feeding. Another advantage is it will shorten the hospital stay. These are some of the important points in feeding of the baby. Now, another important question for the young doctors, till when you give IV fluid, when baby has already started to feed? Isn't it very important question to ask? And the answer is IV fluid is needed until the feeding provide about 120 ml per kg of the fluid. Now, let me give you one example here. If this baby is 2 kg, okay, let's take an example. This baby is 2 kg. So the total fluid needed by this baby is 240 ml. Okay, 240 ml. Okay, now. 240 ml is the total amount of fluid required by this newborn. Now, you are giving fluid 10 ml in one time. Okay, 10 ml in one time. And that you are giving every two hourly. Now, if you give every two hourly, you give 12 times in 24 hour. Now, 10 multiplied by 12 will be only 120 ml of fluid. That is not enough. So another 120 ml has to be given by IV fluids. So this is how you need to balance. Now once the baby start to feed 20 ml of milk every two hour, you don't need to give any extra IV fluid now because the baby is already receiving 240 ml. So this is one of the very important practical knowledge. Okay, uh, remember this.
Now, what are the feeding method? Okay, in this newborn baby, the best is breastfeeding. There is no doubt about it. If a baby can, if the baby is born after thirty-four weeks, baby can breastfeed well. Baby can swallow also well, so no problem. But if the baby is born before thirty-four weeks, then nasogastric or orogastric feeding has to be done. Now, in the in the you know few classes ago, I clearly taught you about how to put NG tube. Okay. Now let me repeat again because this is very important here. If you don't know how to put NG tube, you can never start NG tube feeding. And sometimes those nurses will ask you to put NG tube, so you should know this how to put. So first is the measurement. Now, what is the length of the NG tube you will put inside, isn't it? And that measurement is done by from the okay from the, the uh, nose okay uh, from the base of the nose we should say till the ear and till the gyphoid uh, process okay from the root or base of the nose. Till the ear, and from there till the gyphoid process. That is the total length you are going to insert from the nose. Now, how you are how you are sure that it is in the stomach? That is another very important question because when we put it from the nose, it will go into the nasopharynx first. It will go into the oropharynx first. Uh, after that, sorry, and then go into the laryngopharynx. Now, from the laryngopharynx, we have got two pathway. One will go towards the airway, and another will go towards the esophagus. Okay, one will go towards the airway, and another will go towards the esophagus. For example, these are the two pathway. For example, uh, this is esophagus. Okay, esophagus, and here is the trachea. Now, can anybody tell me how you know this is in the stomach and not in the airway? Yes. Or by using syringe. Yes. Yes. In the injection. In the injection. In the injection. In the injection. In the stomach. Okay, Rana, Atisham, can you can you answer? Yes. Or by using a syringe with with some air in this nasopharyngeal uh, tube and send the sound. Okay, okay. So, so uh, he's right. Actually, and other students are also telling the the correct one. I already heard them. Okay, so let me revise for all of the other students. So, what we do is. We take a syringe of five mL or ten mL, okay, and and fill that syringe with air, and attach that syringe with one end of the NG tube, which is outer end. Then you push that air. At the same time, you auscultate. Put your stethoscope on the epigastric region first. Listen here. In the epigastric region first, if you can hear that large gush of the air. Right there in your ear, through your stethoscope, okay, you are in the right place because we want to uh, keep that one end of the NG tube inside the stomach. So you are in the right place. If you do not hear any sound like that, okay, then aspirate, okay, then aspirate, okay, uh, and readjust again. This is the way. Now, if you do not uh, confirm yourself and just put it inside, you are in big trouble because the milk will directly go into the lung, and that can lead to aspiration pneumonia. The baby uh, may become very sick after that. Now, you have already kept NG tube, so and you started to feed from there. Everything will be all right. But if the baby is very sick, if the baby is very very premature. Then you cannot uh, give milk like that. So parenteral nutrition should be given. So what are the indication for parenteral nutrition? Remember, parenteral means IV nutrition. 
if the infant is less than 1500 gram if infant is between 1500 to 1800 gram for whom significant enteral intake is not expected for more than 3 days mean we cannot start the ng tube feeding at all now without proper nutrition or calorie there is a big problem in the baby so we cannot only give iv fluid we have to start some other nutrition that is why parenteral nutrition will come into the play another important point if the infant is more than 1800 g for whom significant enteral intake is not expected for more than 5 days then also we are not going to wait longer we need to start the parenteral nutrition now what are those parenteral nutrition what are the elements of parenteral nutrition anyone what we give we can give carbohydrate not saline okay okay fine so we give okay we we give okay we we give all the smallest component of macronutrients smallest component now you got your answer the smallest component of carbohydrate is glucose or dextrose so we give that isn't it from the protein side it's amino acid and from the fat it is fatty acid so you give glucose amino acid and fatty acid along with that vitamins are also given so this is called parenteral nutrition it has to be given through the vein and it has a lot of complication associated with it we cannot give it for a longer duration that's why it has to be replaced by enteral feeding that is ng tube feeding or breast feeding now some other important point regarding feeding of the uh, preterm baby this is a little bit like a practical discussion for us multivitamin drops should be given and folic acid should be a important component of multivitamin we should be started from 2 weeks because by that time the gi tract is already ready iron should be started at 2 weeks we don't give iron before that and the dose of the iron is 2 to 3 mg per kg vitamin e one of the very important antioxidant also should be started by around 2 weeks time and if the baby is very premature even calcium and phosphate supplementation has to be given otherwise the baby will suffer from osteopenia of prematurity okay now listen one important point here the transfer of calcium and phosphate from the mother will occur in third trimester so if this baby is born at 32 week now that this baby is born about 6 week earlier okay than the uh, full term so till that period we need to give calcium and phosphate or till the baby becomes 2 kg weight so this is the meaning now how do you know the feeding is optimum in that baby you are giving good feeding how do you know that this is done by every day monitoring you are going there okay you are examining that baby every day you take weight every day and all these things now see here in the beginning most baby lose weight during the first 3 to 4 day and the loss is up to 10 to 15% of the body weight they lose weight in the beginning and that is done that is because of because they lose more excessive amount of fluid from the body this weight loss is because of fluid loss from the body and they slowly start to regain the weight and by 10 to 14 days everything will be all right they regain birth weight at 2 weeks and one very interesting point here is iugr or sga infant or baby they gain weight from first day without loss because we can compare this type of baby with marasmic baby marasmic baby are very hungry they can tolerate milk right from the beginning same principle is applicable 
for SGA babies as well. So if I give good amount of milk, this baby will gain weight right from the beginning. They don't lag behind. So this is one of the exception in SGA baby. Now, full term baby, okay, or the baby who, who is born after 37 completed week, they lose around 8% of the body weight in first four days and regain the birth weight on day eight. Now let me compare between these two points once again, okay, so that you have good concept here. Preterm baby, they lose more percentage of body weight and they take longer time to regain it as well. They take maybe about two weeks time to regain the birth weight. Whereas full term baby, they lose half of the body weight in first four days and regain the birth weight on day eight. So exactly, you know, double time is required by preterm baby and they lose double weight than full term baby as well. But we don't need to worry much. This weight will be recovered and after that, they will only gain. Now, what about the vaccination? In preterm baby, okay, they are able to mount satisfactory immune response like full term baby. So the same dose of vaccination is given. You don't need to reduce the dose of the vaccine. Same dose is given. There is one small exception for hepatitis B vaccine because studies have shown that there is poor seroconversion in preterm baby who are less than 2 kg regarding the hepatitis B vaccine. So first vaccine in the baby who are negative to hepatitis B surface antigen negative mother is delayed for two months. We don't give immediately at birth. It should be given at two months after birth just to make sure the proper antibody will be formed. So this is one small exception. Otherwise, uh, regarding the vaccination, you don't need to change anything. It is just like a full-term baby. Okay, lastly, let's talk about how can we prevent low birth weight uh, babies like a preterm or IOGR babies? Can we do anything to prevent uh, from them to happen or not? Now, the first thing is improvement of uh, woman literacy. Improvement of woman literacy. We have to do that uh, so that they will be more educated regarding antenatal checking or antenatal care, regarding the nutrition, isn't it? Regarding different aspects of the health. Avoidance of early marriage and teenage pregnancy, very important point, okay? Early marriage and teenage pregnancy means less than 18 years of age. Now, if somebody uh, is pregnant in less than 18 uh, years, I should say, sorry, years of age, then there is very high chance of premature uh, birth or even IOGR. Now, ensuring interpregnancy interval of at least three years. This is important uh, just to make sure the baby doesn't burn IOGR. Good quality antenatal care. Okay, every student knows this point already. At least four times antenatal visit must be there in each pregnancy. Enhanced caloric intake, supplementation of iron and folate during pregnancy. Now, the nutrition or nutritional intake should be good. Okay, calories should be adequate. Iron and folic acid should be supplemented and even calcium should be supplemented. Avoid smoking and tobacco during pregnancy. Absolutely important point. Everybody know that. Okay, so we should tell them that they can be very hazardous for the baby. Early detection of pregnancy related complication. If some complications are already there from the first or second trimester, okay, during antenatal visit, they can be identified and handled properly, like pregnancy induced hypertension, which may occur after 20 weeks of gestation. But if, if that lady is going repeatedly to the antenatal care, that can be diagnosed early, an antihypertensive drug can be given, fetal monitoring can be done, and all those things. Avoidance of physical labor during pregnancy during third trimester. One of the important cause of IUGR or small for gestation age is yeah. She is not taking enough rest during third trimester. Okay, very important point. So uh, those ladies should take break from the work 
and they should have enough rest and lie down on the bed most of the time so that there will be good flow towards the uterus and to the baby so that baby will grow well. So at the end, okay, just like any other topic, I always prepare some questions for the students. So please go through them very sincerely, okay, and solve them. It will help you a lot in your future exam. Thank you so much.